Hi, my name is Craig Hendrich, and I've been going to Rolling Hills for about 10 years now, and I get the privilege to serve alongside my wife, Jen, uh, in the middle school ministry. I'm Jen, and I'm the middle school pastor at Rolling Hills. So Craig and I met um, the summer of 2013. We were both interning at the church. I was a year long um, intern and then he was coming in for the summer from school. First couple weeks home, I went on a missions trip to DC. And I remember talking to uh, some of the other interns who had got to work with Jen and they were telling me all about how fun Jen was and how you need to meet her. And I just remember thinking that I definitely needed to meet this girl as soon as I got home. And so the first Sunday back from, uh, from that missions trip, I went right up to her and I introduced myself and uh, we've been best friends ever since. So we decided today about a year after meeting, really quickly on, we realized whether or not we were gonna be able to make communication a priority, um, whether or not that trust was gonna be there. We've had a lot of mentors here at Rolling Hills over the years, and um, they've really been able to instill in us um, you know, this idea of setting boundaries and how um, in their own relationships and in their own marriages, how setting boundaries have, have just been so crucial in, in such a, a happy and, and long-lasting marriage. And, and being on the other side of that now too, it's, it's definitely, we can see it as well, um, where having those boundaries um, you know, makes our, our, our connection to each other more intimate and more special than if we hadn't have waited before marriage. You know, I think culture is all about this um, instant gratification and not and just doing everything that you want right now you know making making yourself happy right now god laid it out for us so clearly and in doing so and being faithful to him we see that he has blessed our marriage so well that's what really um, created so much joy in our marriage and, and again that connection and and just that, that special connection that you can't have anywhere else Oh, well, good morning. Good morning, church. It's so good to be back with you. I was gone the last couple of weeks in Moldova, which was awesome, and serving there. And we had three mission teams from our church serving. Uh, about 70 people from our church have been over there working in the poorest, smallest country in the former Soviet Union. And it's just incredible what God's doing there. It's awesome to see lives being changed and transformed. And so I was there for uh, two of our kids in the orphanages. Uh, they have grown up in our transitional homes, and now they got married a couple weeks ago, which was awesome being there for their wedding and then graduation and uh, seeing a lot of our kids. Uh, and guys, God is using you, church. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and I'm so thankful. I mean, because we're seeing lives being saved and transformed for the glory of God. It takes all of us praying, giving, going, serving uh, to really make a difference. So I'm so grateful and thankful for you, church. I love you guys. And also, welcome back. We're in a great series, a great series called I Am David. And in this series, we're finding our story in the life of this guy in the Bible. We're seeing our story in his story. And just like Jen and Craig, I mean, you're going to see that unfold in David's life and, and not putting up boundaries in David's life, but the impact that it has on him and the impact it has on us today. David's name is mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible. I mean, think about that. I mean, a thousand times in the Bible, it, Jesus is referred to as the son of David. And so you just see the impact of his life. And so we're watching as we see this guy and his story unfold through scripture and we're seeing how it resonates with us. David, we saw the first week was chosen. He was chosen by God, you know, and God sent the prophet Samuel down and, and God says, hey, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And there was something different about this kid at 15, 16, and 70 years old. He had a heart for God and God chose him to be the next king. Now, there was already a king in place, so David doesn't officially become king for 10 more years, but we've talked about how God has chosen us. God's chosen you. I mean, think about it. You were born at this time in history for a reason and for a purpose. God put you in the family you're in for a reason and for a purpose. God chose you. Don't ever forget that. David holds on to God, and as he grows up, he fights some battles. He faced a giant, you know, Goliath, nine feet, nine inches tall, and David goes, yeah, you come at me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come at you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, and David takes him down, you know, I mean, just these great victories that God wins through David's life. And Saul is still in charge, but David honors him and respects him. David has these great friendships, and God just blesses. And when Saul dies, David becomes the king officially at the age of 30. And at the age of 30, and if you were here last week, Pastor Eric did a great job talking about godly leadership and how do you have godly leadership. But if you missed, go back and watch or listen, because it's so important for all of us. And David did that. 
And everything we've seen in David's life has been up and to the right. I mean, he has had battle after battle. He's come from being a shepherd boy to now king over Israel, having a palace, having all of this that he's won. And, and God has just blessed him. And then today, it all changes. <laughs> today, the whole story changes. And it's like we've watched this building being built, you know, and then just one stick of dynamite or one dumb decision and boy, you just watch it all implode. And what I am thankful for is that the Bible's honest about its heroes. And God doesn't choose perfect people. And God chooses people like you and me who have flaws and struggles and even regrets. And today we're gonna see that in David's life. And it's not easy, it's hard. And yet we see that God is there even though David turns his back on God and makes a decision that impacts so many other people. You see, in all of our lives and all of our stories, you know, we have the opportunity to follow God and do what God has for us. We have the opportunity to turn our back and to walk away. We have the opportunity to sin and say, you know what, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, God. I really don't care what you think. And even though God has been so faithful to us, there's still inside of us this carnal man. And I pray today that God would use this as we talk about David's stories. We, we see this incident unfold in his life. I pray that God will use it for all of us. And whether you're single or whether you're a student, whether you're a young married, you know, and you're just madly in love, whether you've been married 10 years or 30 years or 50 years, that, that God would use this to like strengthen our walk with him and to grow us deeper in our love for him and our love for our spouse and love for those around us. Because we have an enemy who wants to war against us. And Jesus even said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And for us, that we remain faithful and we hold on to God. David didn't. And we're gonna see it happen today. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you up with me to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Man, it gets real today right here. 2 Samuel, Old Testament, toward the front of the Bible. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books. That's the law, the Torah, how God's telling his people to live. Then Joshua as they come into the promised land. Judges who rule over the land, you know, before the kings. And you got Ruth, this little book uh, that's God pursuing his people. And then First and Second Samuel that talks about Saul, David, and the kings. And we're seeing that right here at 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, we got some Bibles for you in the back. We'll also put the scripture on the screen as you follow along with what God's word has to say. So pick up here, verse one. We're gonna walk through this chapter together. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. But David remained in Jerusalem. And you're thinking, David, what are you doing? This is the time when the kings go off to war, right? This was springtime. It comes after winter. It's spring so they can move supplies around. And, and David should have been leading the army. David was a warrior. He was always out on the front lines. God always gave him victory. He was out there. But David now has built a palace. And David had moved the capital from Hebron to Jerusalem, the city of David. He's got this palace. He's kicked back in his palace. He's got his 60 inch, you know, HD TV, you know, and he's kind of kicked back on the couch and he's watching. He's like, yeah, you guys go out and fight. Peace out, right? I'm gonna stay here. He wasn't where he should have been. He wasn't where he should have been. And one evening, David got up from his bed. He walked around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Danger, danger, right, right? Here he is, like on his palace, walking around, and he sees her, and he's like, oh, wow. She's really beautiful. And instead of turning around and going, well, I shouldn't have seen that, shouldn't have been there, shouldn't have gone to that site, he stops and he stares. He looks. And then David sent, verse 3, someone to find out about her. And the man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. I think the messenger's like, David, what are you doing? 
She's the wife. Let me just emphasize that. The wife, right? And remember, you're married too, David, right? You're married. She's the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Remember the guy who's out there fighting for you, one of your mighty men who's out on the front lines? And David just blows past this red flag, right? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. And she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And then she went back home. And David's thinking, <laughs> got away with it. One night stand, right? No big deal. Nobody knows, right? Maybe this messenger, I'm sure he's told a few people, but nobody else knows, right? I, wow, what a great time. What a great time. And then verse five, <laughs> the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. And David's like, oh no. And right here, David could have stopped and said, whoa, 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 I messed up. We gotta stop this madness. This is ridiculous. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He starts thinking about how can I cover it up? How can I get away with this? What can I do? So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked, how's Joab was and how the soldiers were and how the war was going? And then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. Here's some champagne, here's some flowers, take it home to your wife, right? But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all of his master's servants. He did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why don't you go home? And Uriah said to David, and get this, I mean, just look at the irony here. David, the ark in Israel and Judah are staying in tents, Uriah said. And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are, are camped in the open country. How can I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. I mean, the integrity, the character. They say, like, no way, David. I'm not, they're out there, you know, putting it on the line. I'm not going to go home and be with my wife. <laughs> then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. Like, what are you doing, David? You're a man after God's heart. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among the master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and he sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fierce." And then withdraw from him so that he'll be struck down and die. Like, what? Are you kidding me? Like his own death warrant, he sends it? So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king the account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Did you know that they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerob, Bathish? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this... <laughs> Then say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And you would think David's like grieving for his own soldiers, grieving for these guys who are out there fighting for him. But no, look, David told the messenger, ah, uh, say to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. You're like, man, what happened to you, David? Where, where did you just lose it because you mourned for Saul, you know, when he died and he was pursuing you and now your own men. What are you doing? 
When Uriah's wife, I love how it says that. Doesn't even say Bathsheba, right? It just says, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. And David's thinking, oh, wow, look, I look like the hero now, right? Poor Uriah. He died in battle and he left a widow back here who's pregnant. I'll take her into my palace. I'll make sure she's okay. I'll take you. Come on in, you know, look at me. (laughs) And David thinks he's got away with it, right? Nobody knows. And then the last sentence, one of the most penetrating verses in the entire Bible, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Whoa. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. God knows. God knows. God knows your heart. God knows my heart. And God knows what David had done. And David may have thought he got away with it. Uh, I'm pretty sure the whole palace knew too, right? The messengers, they, they talked, but more so God knew. And God says, hey, let this be a warning to you. Lest any of us should fall. If you're taking notes today, here's some things I'd love for you to write down because I think this is so important for all of us guys. It doesn't matter where you are, what age, what stage of life you're in. God has a word for us today. First of all is this. Hey, realize you're vulnerable. Guys, realize you are vulnerable. Sometimes we go, oh, that could never happen to me. No, that's not me. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. We're all vulnerable. I mean, just go and read, you know, USA Today. Just go and look online at the news. I mean, how many in our own country Military leaders, and they get promoted, and they build their whole career, and then they get up to this point, and they're going to be like, you know, put up at the Pentagon, and then all of a sudden, all this stuff comes out in the past. How many times, politicians, you spend all your life building this career, and then the things come out, and man, it's destroyed. It's done. It's over. We're all vulnerable. Every one of us. We have an enemy that wants to destroy our relationship with God. Jesus said it, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief, he comes to steal our joy. He comes to kill our relationship with our spouse, our relationship with others. You know, he comes to destroy our relationship with God. We have to understand that. There is an enemy that doesn't want us to succeed, doesn't want our relationship with God to thrive. And so he's gonna come and bring a foothold into our lives or into our hearts and into our minds. We have this enemy. And this is the oldest trick of the enemy in the book. David fell for it, and I pray we don't. You know, if you go back to Genesis chapter one, God created man, right? Genesis one, Genesis two, God creates Adam and Eve, and and I mean, things are great, right? They are in right relationship with God. They are in right relationship with each other. They've got this great marriage thing happening. They're in this beautiful garden. There's waterfalls. There's birds like flying over the top. I mean, there's just like perfect, all these fruits and things to eat. And God says, just don't eat from this one tree. All of this is yours, right? All of this, just stay away from that one tree. And what do they do? Genesis chapter three. They go, God, we don't want to do it your way. We want to do this. We want this tree. We want this fruit, you know? And you're thinking about David's life and you're going, David, you've won every victory. God has blessed you beyond your imagination. You were a shepherd boy who's now the king over all. Why don't you just trust God? And David's like, no, I want that. (laughs) I want her. Genesis chapter three, when Satan comes and tempts Eve, what does it say there? It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, she took it and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband and who took it and ate it. When David saw the woman and pleasing to his eye, instead of walking around, what do you do? He took it. He took it. She went in like, you're thinking, what are you doing? You know, lust is I must have it now. Love is, what can I do for you? How can I make you feel? I'm gonna wait on God's timing because I care about you. Lust is what can you do for me? And David just goes 
in right there. It's the oldest trick in the book and it happens all of the time. And guys, I want to tell you this. We're under attack. You're under attack. Your marriage is under attack. And Satan uses the same exact trick today. Same exact thing today. Satan uses pornography today to destroy both marriages and lives. And it's the same thing. I just want to show you a few stats on pornography today. Look at this. The porn industry's annual revenue is more than the NFL, NBA, and MLB combined. Combined. The porn industry also, the second is also more than the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC. Satan uses the same thing in our lives, in our world. I mean, really, it's, it's, it's an attack. Look at this statistic. 47% of families in the United States reported that pornography is a problem in their home. That's right at half. 47%. Look at this one. 56% of American divorces involve one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. 56%. Guys, as a pastor, I counsel a lot of people and I, I gotta tell you, it, it's real. It's real. And, and pornography, it's in our home, it's on our phone, it's right there, it's in our face. And it's something that Satan's using. You know why? Because it erodes our capacity for intimacy. It erodes our capacity with our spouse. It erodes our capacity to see them the way God made them and not some computer enhanced image. It's a lie. Look at this though, 68% of church going men. Now statistic of non-church going men is closer to 90%. But 68% of church going men and 76% of young Christian adults, 18 to 24 year old, are actively searched for porn. But it's not just men, look at that. 33% of women aged 25 and under Search for porn at least once per month. Guys, it's our world. It's our culture. And it is so relevant today. And we're under attack just as David was under attack. And you're thinking, David, you defeated a giant by the power of God, right? But now your own lust, boy, it's going to tear you down. It's going to break you down. God gives us this account of David to serve as a warning you see, the fact is God loves you, guys. God wants you to have a great life. God wants you to be successful. God wants you to have a great marriage. He wants you to raise great kids. He is for you. And so he says, hey, here's a warning. Don't think it's just, you know, like I'm gonna skate by here. No, 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 this is a warning for you and for me, for all of us. I read the other day an article about this guy, uh, a lawyer in New York. He went to the running of the bulls. And, and he goes out to the running of the bulls and he tries to get out in the middle of it and take a selfie. I'm not kidding. The dude's in the hospital right there in Spain, right? I mean, he's in the hospital because he got gored in the neck. You know, he's gonna make it, he's gonna survive. But you're kind of going, well, yeah. I mean, like, what are you thinking? But that's what we do so many times. We're kind of casual with sin. We're like, ah, oh, it's no big deal. Yeah, I can yeah, toy with it a little bit. It's not gonna hurt me. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. You're stepping into the middle of a stampede. Stop. And God says, hey, here's a warning. Here's a warning. Number two, understand the downward spiral of sin. Understand the downward spiral of sin. The consequences of sin are enormous. In your life, those you love, and others. Now, praise God for grace, okay? And we're gonna see that next week. We're gonna talk about these. Don't miss next week, but, but listen, praise God for grace and for forgiveness. But guys, there are still consequences, huge consequences. Some of you know the consequences because you've had this in your family. There's consequences here, and if you can start to recognize this downward spiral, the downward spiral starts with the drift. It starts with a drift. You know, David wasn't where he should have been, right? And David's walking around the palace and, and he sees her and he he's kind of starts to look that way. 
He was just drifting. In your life, when the drift starts to happen, that ought to be like, you know, a warning sign for you. Like, oh man, I, you know, I can't really make it to church. I mean, I just don't have time, you know, and, and we got travel ball coming up and we're going to be gone. And, and, and so you just kind of start to drift. I mean, who has time for a community group, you know, and, or a men's group or a women's group? And, and the next thing you know, you find yourself isolated. You just drifted. You drifted. And you find yourself where you shouldn't be. And then the second is disregard. I mean, David knew, right? I mean, the Ten Commandments are sitting in the ark, okay? So he's kind of got like a right front row seat right there. The Ten Commandments, right? Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. David knew, he just kind of disregarded it. And our lives are you know, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a lie. It's not that big of a deal. It's like, you know, I'm just cheating a little bit on my income taxes. It's not that big of a deal. You know, like, I mean, you know, come on. I know I just got drunk. It was a one night thing. It's no big deal. It's just, it's just this disregard for the things of God. And then it leads to this deliberate, deliberate. And David's checking her out and the messenger comes back. She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. I don't care. Go get her. I don't care. Have you ever been there, right? And you, you, you start to say something and you know, you start to do something, it's like the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And then you go, well, it's okay, God will forgive me. God will forgive me. I'll just go ahead and do this this one time. It's no big deal. God will forgive me. You know what that is? That's a cheap grace. That's exactly what it is because our sin took Jesus to the cross. And the Holy Spirit's convicting us. And the Holy Spirit's going, stop, stop, stop. And we're just like, yeah, deliberate, pushing past it, going on. After that, it leads to deceitful. You know how you have to cover it up? David's like, he commits this adultery and then he's like, I got to cover it up. David never thought, hey, I'm going to murder one of my key guys. That wasn't on David's radar, but it's just this slippery slope. It's just a slippery slope, right? Sometimes when we lie, we have to lie to cover up our lie. And then we're lying to cover up that lie. And the next thing you know, we can't remember what we were lying about before. We're like, oh, I'm so off track. I mean, how is my lie going? And it, it just like goes down. Stop lying because we just be honest. And then it comes destructive. I mean, think about all the people that are damaged in this. Bathsheba. I mean, she probably honestly didn't have a choice. That puts us on a whole different level right here, right? Uriah, Abimelech, one of David's best fighters gets a millstone dropped on his head and killed. Why? Because of David? All of these people, David's family, we're gonna see that in the coming weeks. I mean, David's family is a wreck after this. His kids, innocent kids. I mean, it impacts so many and then just, it's dishonorable, <laughs> I mean, after this, David thinks he's gotten away with it. He shows up for worship at the temple. Yeah, I'll lead us in. You know, come on. I'm just not even going to deal with that. And the whole time, the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The thing David had done displeased the Lord. You see this downward spiral? David could have stopped it at any point, but he didn't. At any point, David could have gone, you know what, I messed up. I should have done it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to Bathsheba. Uriah, come here. Let's sit down. We're going to talk about this. We, we got to figure it out. I'm so sorry. You could have confessed it. Stop sin now. If there's sin going on in your life and in your heart, man, stop now. And don't just wait and think, oh, I'm going to get out of this thing. No, stop now. Stop now. Here's the third one, look, flee, don't flirt. Flee, don't flirt. David should have been walking around, seen her, whoo, walked away. Shouldn't have seen that. Uh-uh, I'm getting out. But he stopped. See, temptation is not a sin. Get that today, guys. Temptation is not a sin. We're all gonna be tempted. I mean, you're gonna end up on the wrong website. You're gonna end up at something. There's gonna be a billboard there. There's gonna be a TV show there. There's gonna be something. Out. We're gonna end up there. Temptation's not a sin. Jesus was tempted. Three times, right? Jesus was tempted. Temptation's a test. Temptation's like, am I gonna stand there and look at this? Am I gonna stand there and let this come in? Or am I gonna walk away and say, no, 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 no. Temptation is a test. Men are visually stimulated. Women are emotionally stimulated. 
And when you know that, right, your eyes are the window of the soul. You start going in, it's good, it's pleasing, and it gets in and it takes root in your heart, your life. But women, emotionally, oh, this guy, you know, I saw him at the gym. He said I was pretty. I've been working out, you know, this guy at work. And the next thing you know, it's just like my husband never says that. And here I am. But when you are tempted, set it as an opportunity to choose God. When you're tempted, set it as an opportunity to choose God. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. He writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. But here's what we do. We don't flee. What do we do? We flirt. We're like, oh, they're interested in me. Wow, that's kind of nice. Wow, I'm going to need to come over here a little bit more. Wow, here's the line, you know, and I know I shouldn't do it, but, but, but here's the line. How close can I get? Instead of going, no, 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 I'm out. I'm out. Uh, hey, if, if, if you at your workplace, and man, there is a physical attraction or there's an emotional attraction and you're just feeling it kind of go down, get away, flee. I mean, seriously, quit your job. Get a new job. Unemployment's really low right now. Find a new place, get a new place. Go there. I'm not kidding, right? If you, your cell phone number and there's texting that's happening and you're going, okay, this is getting close to the line. We're getting right there. Change your number. Don't try to be the tough guy and fight it. Don't try to be the one like, oh, I could only, flee, run away. It's not worth it. When you are tempted, pray. <laughs> God help. You know, David never did that, did he? <laughs> David never stopped to pray and say, God, what do you want me to do here? David was already bent on what he was gonna do there. Focus on scripture. Jesus, every time he was tempted, he answered with scripture. Hey, here's a scripture, here's a scripture. Get into the word, start thinking, and then confess. Guys, confess. Talk to your spouse. Talk to the person you're dating. You know, get a counselor. We have Cindy Hayes, who's on our staff. She's our staff counselor. She'll see you for free. Listen, do it. The Refuge Center right here in our community, over 50 counselors. I mean, amazing, do amazing work. Hey, here's my email. I'm gonna put it up there, right there. If you need anything, Seriously, if you just think like, you know what? I'm struggling in this. Here's, I, I need help. I need help. Here you go. Email me, please, 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 please. I love you guys. I love you. And I just don't want to see this go on in your life. We need each other. And David never stopped. He never stopped. He just continued down that path of destruction. Here's the next one. What you feed grows, what you starve dies. I want to tell you, this is so important. What you feed grows, what you start. Guys, we know this. I mean, like in your yard, right? If you stop watering your yard, it dies. It just happens every time. You water your yard, water your yard, you got to mow it like two or three times a week. I mean, it just, what you feed grows, what you starve dies. David, verse one, did you notice this? It says that David was asleep, right? Or verse two, and he gets up from, the, from his bed to walk around the roof. Why did he get up from his bed? He probably knew Bathsheba was going to be bathing at that time. He probably played this whole scenario out in his head before it ever happened. He'd probably been thinking about this a long time. And so when he goes out there and he sees it, he's dialed in. What you feed grows. What you starve dies. In your life, are you feeding the things of the world or are you feeding the things of God? In your life, I mean, what are you putting into your head? What are you putting into your mind? What are you putting into your heart? What are you allowing into your heart, into your mind? Philippians chapter four, Philippians chapter four. Here's what the apostle Paul writes. He says, dear brothers and sisters, both of us, all of us, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. <laughs> Put those things in your mind. Put things that are good and you'll starve out the things that aren't. You see, you sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a lifestyle. It starts here. It starts with what you feed. It starts with the things that you put in your mind. Hey, make a deliberate decision to develop the heart and mind of Jesus. 
You know the Apostle Paul? Here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 13. He goes, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. I grew up. I matured. I said, I want to be the man that God's called me to be. I want to be the woman God's called me to be. I want to make a difference with my life. I'm putting the childish stuff away. Come on. And I'm going to live my life for the glory of God. So here's the last one. Commit your life fully to Jesus. Fully to Jesus. A lot of times we want to live with like one foot in the world and one foot with Jesus. And we're kind of like, you know, trying to do this balancing act. And man, just say, I'm in. Jesus, I'm all in. Follow Jesus and allow him to be the pursuit of your life. I'm not, I'm not pursuing the things of this world. I'm not pursuing, you know, women or money or let those things be my God and be obsessing over that stuff. I'm pursuing Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. <laughs> Are there any areas of your life where God is displeased? Are there any areas of your life where that verse could come through and say the thing, put your name there, did displease the Lord? You know what? In our lives, man, that we come fully open to God. God, here I am. See, Jesus wants the best life for you. Please don't miss that. I mean, David, when he was following the Lord, I mean, he just was thriving. Well, he was thriving. God was blessing. In your marriage, in your family, in your career, God wants the best for you. Trust him. Follow him. Come clean before Jesus today. Come clean. God, here it is. Here's the struggle. Here's the thing, God, that, boy, it's got a hold of my heart. It's got a hold of my mind. And God, I need help. I need hope. And God, I'm going to come clean. God, I'm going to bring it to you. God, help me. God, don't let Satan get a foothold in my life. Don't let Satan get a foothold in my marriage. Don't let Satan get a foothold in my marriage. Father, in my family or any area, God, let me be a man or a woman that you created me to be. And God, if there's sin, stop it now. Holy Jesus. I don't know where you are today, but I know this, God's here. And God brought you here for a reason or for a purpose to meet with him. Would you be open to him today? Would you be real? Would you be honest? God, this is what's going on. And God, I give it to you. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. I don't know where you are today, but God does. And God knows your heart. And so this morning, we just say, God, here it is. Yeah, I'm not perfect. None of us are. But God, I want to be a man or woman who loves you. I want to have a great marriage or a great future marriage. God, I want to have a great family. And God, the sin, I give it to you. I confess it. So Father, meet me right here in this moment. Change me, God. Give me hope. Give me help. <laughs> Jesus, you're the only one who can change a heart. You're the only one who can bring life into darkness. And so I pray right now, Father, that you would fall fresh upon every one of us. I pray that you would give us the courage, God, to do whatever we need to do. And where sin as a whole, and whether it's pornography, whether it's an affair, whether it's a lie, whether it's dead, whether, whatever, Father, that Satan is using to trap us, Father, today I pray for freedom. Today I pray that we would bring it into the open, that we would bring it into the light, and that we would get help and hope. Only Jesus can do that. So, Father, we commit our lives to you. Speak to us in this moment, right here, right now.
You're my constant in the chaos. You're my compass when the road is long. You're my portion, never failing for me. Just you let my heart want for nothing but you just you the riches of this world could never satisfy let my heart want for only you let my heart want for nothing but you just you let my Just you, the riches of this world could never satisfy. Let my heart want for only you. For me, for me, only Jesus. For me, for me, only Jesus. For me. For me, only Jesus. For me, for me. Let's sing this out, church. For me, for me, only Jesus. For me, for me, only Jesus. For Jesus for me, for me, for me. Let my heart want for nothing but you, just you. Let my heart want for nothing but you, just you. The riches of this world could never satisfy. Let my you. Let him be the desire of your heart. Let him be the love of your life. Pursue him with everything you have and watch God work in your life. Because guys, hear this. God is faithful and God is greater. Whatever you're facing today, whatever struggle you're facing, God is faithful and God is greater. Whatever you feel like Satan has going on in your life or your marriage or your family, God is faithful and God is greater. You hold on to him. You trust him. You follow him because he is there for you. And he can bring healing and he can bring hope. Holy Jesus. Holy Jesus. After the service, I'll be here. There'll be people on our staff, our pastoral care team. We'd love to talk with you, pray with you. Some of our A6 men will be here. Guys, don't fight the battle alone. That's what church is for. That's what community is for. That's what the body of Christ is. We lock arms. We serve together. We fight together. At this time, I want to invite our ushers to come forward. And this is a chance for us to give back to God, a chance for us to invest in God's kingdom and for God's glory. And wow, our God is so good to us. We've all been blessed beyond our wildest imagination so many times. And for us to be able to give back. If you're a first-time guest, all we ask is you would give God this communication card so that you could just give him your heart and saying, hey, I'm here, I'm present, I want to be a part of your church and I want to know what's going on. If you want me here, if you give him the prayer request, the things that are going on in your life, write those down, drop them in the basket. He hears, he sees, he cares. And he loves you. So let me pray for us. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your presence this morning. And God, it's not easy, God. Your word is truth, though. And I thank you, God, that you love us enough to say, hey, don't go down this path. Follow me. Trust me. I thank you that you're a God of grace. I thank you that you're a God of 
forgiveness. And, and yet, God, you're a God who speaks so clearly. And so, God, give us the courage to confess. Give us the courage to follow. Give us the courage to be the men and women you created us to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we give. Amen. Amen.